to be here, and my hat is uh, my favorite hat. I think it makes me re look rather handsome. Um, this hat is made from a mushroom called amadou. Amadou is a birch polypore, and amadou is a hard wood conch, and um, this mushroom is responsible for human survival not too long ago. There's no doubt that we all came from Africa. We went north. We discovered something new called winter. Oops. <laughs> this mushroom allowed for the portability of fire. Moreover, you can hollow this mushroom uh, out, put embers of fire inside, and carry fire for days. And the, the firekeeper of our uh, clans, thousands of years ago, were absolutely critical for the clan's survival. Well, this mushroom has other properties, and when you boil this mushroom, it delaminates and becomes mycelium, a fabric. And so, so some ladies in Transylvania have kept this tradition alive. So this thread of knowledge has carried forth over thousands of years, and so many threads of knowledge have been interrupted because of famine, disease, and war. Well, this mushroom was first described by uh, Hippocrates in 450 uh, BCE as an anti-inflammatory as well as, as for cauterizing wounds. Um, another mushroom I brought, a mushroom friend of mine, also is a polypore woodcock, and this is agaricon. Agaricon is the longest living mushroom in the world, grows exclusively in the old growth forest, now presently only known from Northern California, Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia, and a sky island or two in Central Europe. It was described by Dioscorides in the very first Materia Medica as elixirium ad longum vitum, the elixir of long life. And it was suggested thousands of years ago as a treatment against consumption, later to be known um, as tuberculosis. So I'm going to take you on a journey, and I'm going to take a radical left turn halfway through this talk, and I'm going to present some data that has never been shown to, any, to anyone else outside of my research team. So I am honored to be representing AAAS on June 9th of this year. I was awarded as the Invention Ambassador. This is great. It's like the first audience that knows what AAAS is, so I don't have to explain that, but it's a huge honor. Um, and I grew up in a small town in Ohio, and my brother John um, was my, got me into science, and he went on to Yale, and my brother Bill went on to Cornell, and we had this incredible laboratory in the basement, which they would not let me have access to, but they went off to college, and I suddenly had this fully equipped laboratory, including the, um, the radio from the aircraft carrier, the Intrepid. My father was on it, and after World War II, he got the radio. So I was listening to all sorts of things behind the Iron Curtain. I was just having a fabulous time. So my dream was always to live in the country and to be a scientist and have my own, own scientific laboratory. Well, on June 9th, I, I got that award. My brother John, we were competitive. And you know, like brothers are, you love them 80% of the time, and 20% of the time, they kind of piss you off. And so John really never respected, you know, my, my interest in mycology. What is this mushroom stuff? But so when AAAS gave me this award, it was highly vetted. I said, wow, you know, I can, I can, this is exciting. I can tell my older brother, you now, John, I got this award. So I called him and he didn't answer. And then I emailed him and that was the day they discovered his body. Um, John died from cardiac arrest, standing up. And I just want to tell all of you, you have brothers and sisters that bug you. You know, think about the good times and how life is so precious and so short. So this talk is dedicated to my brother John, who first got me into science. So, my main theme is biodiversity is biosecurity. This is, we live in, I live in Washington State, in the southern regions of the Puget Sound. Um, and I want to point out the largest organism in the world is a mycelial mat. 2,200 acres in size, over 2,000 years old, and it's one cell wall thick, surrounded by hundreds of millions of microbes per gram of soil. We have several skin layers that protect us from infection. The mycelium has one, and yet it achieves the largest mass of any organism in the world. How is that possible? Well, it's possible because it, the, it's involved in a own, its own microbiome. It selects beneficial bacteria that it works in concert with, and the mycelium has based on a network-like design. 
The mycelium is uh, digests nutrients externally. We share a more common ancestry with fungi than we do with any other kingdom. 650 million years ago, we split from fungi, and there is now a new super kingdom that's been published called a Pistaconta that joins animalia and fungi together. We exhale carbon dioxide, we inhale oxygen, and the fungi are able to stream nuclei to their tips. And because of epigenesis and the ability to adapt to change, this is one of the few organisms that actually benefits from disruption. And so when these mats are disrupted, the fork, the streaming of nuclei, epigenesis comes into play, reassortment nuclei at the end tips, it codes for new genes, for new enzymes, acids to capture new food, and then the information becomes back channeled into the mycelial network. So using the epigenic properties of mycelium, I think is a way of the future of medicine. So the mycelium is a lot more pervasive than most people realize. Virtually 90% of all plants have mycorrhizal fungi. It's now been determined that these mycorrhizal networks and the mycelium communicates across uh, landscapes and between plants. And indeed, all plants are part fungi. So any research on botanical medicine, the contribution of the endophytic fungi that are associated inside this plant needs to be uh, taken in, into account because the conferring medicinal properties may be well coming from the endophytic fungi as opposed to the plant by itself. These mycelial networks stream across landscapes, and I have these epiphanies, and I believe habitats have immune systems, and the mycelial networks are the foundation of the food web that's joining us all together. Now here is something that's, I grow lots of mycelium, 20 to 30,000 kilos a, a week. We have a small company, 67 employees, and this is really, frankly, just not fair, that I can tell you this in 15 seconds, what took me 30 years to discover. The problem with growing mycelium in a laboratory is it's immunologically naive. It's grown in pure culture. When you throw it out into the ground, all these organisms consume it. Well, we soak wood chips or straw underwater, salt water or fresh water, for two weeks. Anaerobic, anaerobes become pr predominant. Then we take this out and we drain off the water, and then the oxygen becomes a sterilizer. The anaerobes are largely killed, semi-aerobes are in there, and then the mycelium then becomes immunologically educated. This is a profoundly powerful mycelium. It's got an immune system, and resident within this mycelium is enormous amounts of bacteria. We did next-gen sequencing here, and this is a, a, a color heat map, a thousand-fold difference in the relative abundance of different genera of bacteria, two different mushroom species selected out whole, whole different constellations of bacteria. This enables the mycelium to sell, set up guilds and have commensable mutualistic organisms that it can combine with that allows it to conquer such large habitats. Well, we all know that we have cancer. 41% of us will get cancer, 21% of us will die from it. But did you know still that 73% of all anti-cancer drugs have their origins in natural products? We grow about 500 different species. Turkey tails that are featured here are one of the best described and studied medicinal mushrooms in the world. We received a $2.2 million breast cancer clinical uh, grant from the NIH for phase one breast cancer. And the results of the studies have been published. And on a dose-dependent basis, well, prior to radiation, your immune system is, is active. Uh, and then when the turkey tail mushrooms, eight capsules per day, are consumed, there is an upregulation of natural killer cells. And then post-radiation, most of you know, the immune system is damaged, uh, it, and then it has to recover. And then on a dose-dependent basis, two weeks and then four weeks, uh, the immune system uh, kicks into gear. Natural killer cells are enhanced dramatically, and also cytotoxic T cells. Look at the significance value here. And so the immune system is activated by the consumption of these mushrooms. And there's TLR, TLR4 receptors. I don't want to get into that right now. But we've identified seven different distinct pathways that the immune system is activated from the consumption of these mushrooms. Now, this became deeply personal to me in June of 2009 when my 83-year-old mother called me up. She's a charismatic Christian. She's not seen a doctor since 1968. She called me up and says, Paul, I'm scared. I didn't even recognize her voice. She was shaking. I said, what's wrong? And she said, my right breast is five times the size of my left. I have six angry lymph nodes, dark and swollen on my right side. I said, I couldn't believe it. I said, why didn't you tell me sooner? And so I rushed her to Swedish Breast Cancer Clinic in Seattle. And then we got the worst news after the second visit. The oncologist said she should have been seen two years earlier. 
The cancer was inoperable. They could not do a mastectomy because of her age. They, they couldn't give her radiation therapy because of the same reason, because of the likelihood of infection. And so the oncologist tried to make the best of it, saying, you've lived a long life. And we kept on asking, how, how long, how long? And she said, you're lucky if you had three months. The tumor is erupting uh, out of her breast, across the meridian, invaded her sternum, and went, it went into her liver. So we had a circle meeting. Many of you have had this. We planned for her funeral. She chose a pink dress, that bought the cheapest coffin that she could find because she was going to Jesus. There was a lot of tears. And then on the third visit, the oncologist said, you know, if your immune system could, could kick in, Patty, you might be able to beat this. And so she said, you know, there's this turkey tail mushroom study that's going on at Bastyr Medical School and the University of Minnesota Medical School. You might want to take, start taking turkey tail mushrooms. Well, that's my mother said, well, that's what my son was talking about. But she had to hear it from a doctor, right? So my mother started taking turkey tail. She was on Taxol briefly, had a horrific reaction, refused to take it. And, she was, and then she was taking Herceptin, a wonderful drug. Well, that was in June of 2009. And I'm happy to say my mother. Everything's gone. Everything's wonderful. Past all was flying colors. So thank you for your prayers. I love you. And I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. She crossed the five-year disease-free period. She's totally cancer-free. <laughs> now, this led to a, then a study saying, well, maybe turkey tail mushrooms can enhance receptin. Now, this is good news that my mother survived, but then she told me something her oncologist told her. Of the 50 women who joined the Herceptin program and enlisted in a new program in Ellensburg, Washington, where she enlisted, of the 50 women, 48 of them have died. My mother was the only one taking turkey tail with Herceptin. So, how, this is, interesting on multiple levels. She's been written up as a best case outcome in several medical journals. She had no chem brain, no nausea, no loss of appetite. So she's happy and she, her acumen has come back. She's smarter now than, and more quick with her wit than I've ever, ever seen. So then a series of other articles came out this past year. Turkey tail enhances the microbiome, specifically of lactobacillus and, and, and bifidobacterium while suppressing anti-inflammatory bacteria. So this is extremely interesting because this speaks to the fact that when we grow the mushroom mycelium in pure culture, we do see a resident mutualistic population of bacteria, which we at first thought were contaminants, but now we understand better that they're part of the, of the, of, of the microbiome of the fungi. When we split from fungi 650 million years ago, we chose the route of encirculating our food in a gastro, in a sac in a stomach, basically, digesting nutrients within. The mycelium went externally. Well, just as we have a microbiome within us, the mycelium has selected a microbiome also mutualistically to its advantage. I'm very interested in the viral to cancer connection. There are seven identified viruses, there are probably a lot more, that cause cancer. Then Fred Hutch Medical School called me up and said, we had a very interesting case with Merkel cell carcinoma one of the most deadly cancers of the world. Only 10 people have ever been reported to have ever recovered from it. And I call it the NIM hypothesis after Paul NIM, MD, PhD at Fred Hutch. Um, and they had this patient who started taking a seven species mushroom blend. Um, and this is the immune evasion. Uh, and then after taking the mushrooms, there's no chemotherapy, no radiation therapy, nothing can be done for these patients. Um, and then after taking the seven mushroom species blend, he had spontaneous recovery and he is alive today. So we think that it decloaks cancers for discovery by the immune system. We don't know exactly how it does it, but we have seen this over and over again. Your immune system's activated and your immune cells can discover receptor sites in the stroma of tumors. This could go broad and be useful for addressing lots of solid tumors as an adjunct therapy. So this case also was written up in the medical journals. And then um, um, Haling Liu and I submitted a, a application to NIH to standardize the methodology for analyzing medicinal mushroom products. It was going to be open source, but unfortunately the sequester occurred and we did not get funded for this, but it's a great paper that I'll be glad to provide to anyone who likes to see it. The mycelium produces extracellular metabolites, and in these metabolite droplets are all sorts of interesting compounds. I was working with the BioShield program of the U.S. Defense Department directly after 9-11. We submitted over 700 samples. 
And this is the, so the samples of mushrooms in particular, uh, agarikon, reishi, and chaga. And uh, this is the selectivity index and the viruses, H5N1, H3N2, H1N1. Um, and the ribavirin is being the positive control. The selectivity index is an indication of antiviral activity. Our extracts were diluted from the mycelium 100 to 1. And this is the selectivity index of the diluted extracts that were far more powerful than, than the pharmaceutical control. Well, then we, were, we did bioguided fractionation at the University of Mississippi a School of Pharmacy, and we've identified a group of sterols. This one has been unreported in the literature. I've given it the name foamy topsterol. So we have our first a APIs here um, that are active against, in this case, pox viruses. Now, that's coming out of the same agaricon extract that was active against flu viruses. But when you sent these structures to, uh, to uh, 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 St. Jude uh, uh, University, in order to uh, St. Jude Hospital, in order for tests against H5N1, they were totally inactive, which suggests that there's more than one antiviral API that's present within these, th these mushroom extracts. NIH called us three times in the past month. We've submitted now 10 of these structures, a, a potential APIs for testing against Ebola and a wide number of other viruses. So resident with these mushrooms are very interesting complex molecules that we're beginning to discover. So after 10 years, I finally received a patent, universality of opinion by the patent ex 10 patent examiners. And it took a long time to get the patent, but I was happy to see that Vector in Russia published an article two years ago authenticating that agaricon is highly active against flu viruses. This article was published yesterday. So it's, there are, people are catching up, but it's great that other researchers are authenticating that which we had discovered. Now, working with agaricon, uh, and it's Dr. S Scott Franzblau, who's the director of the T Tuberculosis Research Institute at the University of Chicago, we started doing uh, experimentation, and he started using our mycelium, and we did biogative fractionation, and we found a new active anti-TB uh, uh, set of molecules, chlorinated, chlorinated coumarins. Now, this is interesting to me. This mushroom has du a dual activity against viruses and bacteria. Very few medicines do that. The majority of people who die from viral pneumonia actually die from bacterial pneumonia. And so to have something as a nutraceutical that can be broad-based against multiple viruses and multiple bacteria, I think is medically extremely interesting. <coughs> My wife and I <clears throat> spent a lot of time in the old growth forest. The forest used to be resplendent around the world. And now we are facing a radical change in, in, in our ecosystems through deforestation. So the composition and the ecology of the forests have changed. And 70% of the soils are composed of microbial mass, of which 40% of the mass is fungal. But because of our practices of logging and harvesting and creating monoculture, which in repetitive har uh, planting of trees leads to premature decline, disease vectors uh, spread, the diameter of the trees becomes smaller, you lose that, that plurality of, of biodiversity of, of ages of trees and their associated organisms, we have really changed the face of this planet. So I'm gonna now take a radical left Turn. So this is the case. Now imagine hundreds of millions of years, our ancestors and other organisms in the ecosystem have been used to these resplendent forests, and now we've deforested much of the planet. And the deforestation continues at an incredible clip. We've now entered 6X, the sixth greatest extinction event on the life of this, on this planet, and we're losing about 30,000 species per year of 8.3 million species on this planet. That means in 100 years, we'll lose more than 30% of the biodiversity uh, on this planet. This is, this is an all hands on deck moment. So a friend of mine came to me and said, Paul, I do a lot of work with entomopathogenic fungi, controlling insects. He says, can you help the bees? And then Whole Foods provided this very interesting graphic. Here's your dairy choices with bees, and there's your dairy choices without bees. Bees are the great pollinators. 30% of the food in the grocery store is a direct result of pollination. 70% is indirect. And the President Obama came out with a presidential memorandum, and there is a, uh, what do we call it? We call it a hex effect. <laughs> there is like six different converging stressors on the ecosystem. Deforestation is one. 
the bees now don't have the ecosystem that it evolved to, to draw from as part of this menu, this banquet of food. Well, the, then because of the pollution, and one of the speakers mentioned his blood was analyzed and he has a thousand different xenobiotic toxins present in his blood, unprecedented in the theater of, of evolution. Mites are carrying viruses. And then you have uh, the, the fact that the bees are being trucked hundreds of miles into almond orchards in the middle of the desert in California in January and February. This is totally unnatural. So the bees fly out. And when you see bees around a, a flower, that's the last seven or 10 days of their life. The bees flap their wings until the, the, the wings are shredded. And the bees then, with a colony collapse disorder, the bees leave the beehive and they just don't come back. They just suddenly disappear. Now, it's a very complicated set of stressors, but just like there's colony collapse disorder, I suggest to you that we are facing cultural collapse disorder. This is the proverbial canary in the coal mine. So I had some very strange events in my life, a lot more than I can tell you, but, <laughs> but I was growing mushroom mycelium in my garden, and this is 1984, and I went out to my garden, and this is the mushroom beds, and I went, wow, what's going on here? I looked very closely, and bees had come to my mushroom bed, moved the wood chips away, and started sucking on my mycelium. I went, what is going on here? From day to night, for 40 days, for 40 days, a direct stream of bees from my beehives to my mycelium back and forth all day long. The mycelium shrunk from about eight or 10 inches to about three inches. Well, I noted this in one of my books in Harrow Smith Magazine. Virtually everybody ignored me. I got one beekeeper from Canada wrote me, well, maybe that's why they go to sawdust piles. So, okay, I put that in the back of my mind. And then a friend of mine said, you know, what can you do to help the bees? And I thought, well, you know, I had this very weird experience in my garden in 1984. So here's Dusty in the old growth forest and bears scratch trees. Well, we used to have a lot of bears, but the tin industry put a bounty on them, killed the bears, and only in the past 20 years we've come out with research knowing, finding out the bears bring salmon carcasses up on the banks and returning sea phosphorus from the ocean into the roots of the trees, which is a limiting nutrient for tree growth. So the industry totally got it backwards. Bears help trees grow. Well, the bears scratch the trees, and Dusty and I are hiking in the old growth forest and the south fork of the hoe. And we go around the corner and Dusty sees this bear scratch. Bam! The bear scratched the tree. The best bear scratch I've ever seen. That's why I photographed it. And I looked into this and wow, the chimney industry says the bears scratch the trees and it causes a mushroom to form, which is related to a garricon. So we went back two years later, there's that bear scratch. Okay, so think about this. And the bear scratch the trees, and resin comes out, and bees go after the resins, and they get propolis, which is a very strong antimicrobial, and they use for patching up you know, uh, spaces in the beehive. So the red-belted polypore, sure enough, was growing out of that tree where the bear scratch that we saw. So in a sense, the timber industry was correct. This is a parasitic fungus that kills the trees and then grows saprophytically. Well, also interesting, the mycelium breaks down pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides. Okay, so that's another box, another experience I had. The garden, now hiking in the old growth forest, a bear scratch, and I looked into the, you know, why the timber industry was trying to kill the bears. And then this article comes, comes out. These are all very, very recent. And it turns out that fungi produce p cumeric acid. Related to the chlorinated coumarins that Scott Franklin and I found, that are active against tuberculosis, by the way. And it turns out that the absence of P-cumeric acid stops the upregulation of the cytochrome P450 pathway. Bees only have 47 CPY genes, whereas most insects have 80. And the absence of P-cumeric acid coming from fungi turns off their monooxygenase pathway and so they can't detoxify this accumulation of all these toxins that have become resident as they foray out into the farmer's fields sprayed with pesticides, fungicides, and herbicides. Okay, interesting. And so then as it turns out that when the EPA licensed many of these fungicides and insecticides and herbicides, 
they didn't look at the consortium of them all coming together, and it turned out the sublethal doses of these toxins defeat the microbiome in the gut of the bee. So you have another problem happening here. Not only is this monooxidase pathway of the cytochrome P450s turned off, but the microbiome now is being damaged by glycosates, by the way, is one of the big cul culprits. So, um, Craig Ventner, I hope you're listening. Um, so then fungicide contamination in the fields is harming the resident fungi, and now we don't have rotting logs, we've got agricultural crops, many of the species of which are not native. Okay. <clears throat> so beekeepers feed bees sugar water, and up to 50, this is 50% water, 50% sugar, uh, and this is because they need to have the sugar, obviously, for food. Um, and then the bees are trucked hundreds of miles, in this case, to almond and walnut uh, uh, orchards for pollination. So the, the bees are now being fed pure, simple sugars, as opposed to the complex carbohydrates and polysaccharides that was coming from the sweat of the mycelium. So I had an epiphany. Why don't we take our mycelium and my research team, you know, gets credit for this, and we came up with myco honey. This is totally made from mycelium. It's like 90% sugars, but they're complex sugars. And guess what? It has P-cumeric acid in it. It has the antiviral agents in it. It has the antibacterial agents. So we contacted Washington State University, working with uh, Dr. Steve Shepard and, uh, and Brandon Hopkins, and we started doing a series of experiments by feeding extracts of the mycelium to bees at different concentrations. This is called a stress test, they're in captivity, they only live 30 days. When the worker bees fly out and they're doing a pollination, if they don't come back, nurse bees are prematurely recruited to become worker bees and they fly out. They abandon the brood. So it's a doubling down. Every time the fewer and fewer worker bees come back, nurse bees now have to go out and get pollen and food for the hive. So the, the larvae are abandoned, mites then proliferate, mites are injecting viruses into the larvae. Okay, so the mushrooms that we're talking about, including the one in my, my hat, Amadou, Reishi, and Chaga, are polypore mushrooms in birch forests worldwide. Apis mellifera, the honeybee is from Europe. It's not native to North America, but it produces a prodigious amounts of honey. So there's Chaga, there's Amadou, and there's Red Reishi. We provided the bees with 12 different species. These are the three ones I'm gonna talk about. I've never shown this before. This, this information just came, came in. The sugar control, uh, in one week's time, the virus has increased by 63%. When the bees started sipping on the mycelium, the viral uh, pathogen payload plummeted across these three different species. Um, in week one versus week two, the sugar control, the viruses you know, increased dramatically, and with, with the bees that were taking sips of the, of the mushroom mycelium extract, the viruses plummeted, uh, they went up here and they plummeted down on a dose-dependent basis. And so it also occurred with the red ratio. So now we're trying to get the right concentrations. And it's obvious now that if we use a combination of these, you know, what benefit, what added benefit will, will this be? But we don't know the way of the bee. Tomorrow, the Rosetta spaceship lands on a comet 300 million years, uh, 300 million miles out in space. Well, we can find a comet, but we don't know the way of the bee. Now, I've spoken to entomologists about this. They spoke to their friends. No one's ever mentioned this. I spoke at a National Mycological Congress. I said, any mycologist out there, there's 500 mycologists. Has anyone ever heard of this? Bees go, no one has. Bees go to rotted logs because of the immunological benefit, increasing their host defensive resistance, their complex sugars of nutrition, and the antiviral properties. I'm the first one to have discovered this. Really? How is that possible? We grew up with Winnie the Pooh, reading it to our, our kids. They're going after the rotted logs, and, 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 and we don't know the way of the bee. I think this, this says a lot. So Dr. Steve Shepard, he was so impressed, he provided this wonderful quote. As an entomologist with 39 years of experience, I'm not aware of any reports that extend the lives of worker bees. This, is, this spread is incredibly important. This is a period of high pollen uh, 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 acquisition. And so if you increase the workers' lifespans by 20%, it has a tremendous effect on a tipping point, a tipping point uh, in favor of the colony surviving. 
So I suggest to you, let's be friendly. Let's be mushroomed. Scientists across disciplines need to work together. Biodiversity is our biosecurity. Now think of the bigger picture here. We were forest people. Bees evolved in the forest. The mycelium is confer conferring an immunological benefit to two animals, but it's unprecedented, as far as I know, that there is an antiviral agent that is dually active in helping bees and also helping humans. And these are from polypore mushrooms that are resident in the forests that our ancestors were dependent upon. So I want to conclude that humans, trees, bears, mushrooms, or all terrestrial organisms have evolved to be interconnected within the mycelial web of life, Earth's natural internet. And I think the way of the future is using mycelial scaffolding with the mutualistic organisms and the bacteria, using epigenesis, and then being able to have this quorum sensing and the response of being able to upregulate gene expressions that otherwise may not be present or upregulated with one organism, but quorum sensing can give upregulation of multiple gene sequences, otherwise hidden in nature. This is the way of life. So as much as many of you are ultra-specialized, I want you to think about the implications of what I'm showing you today. We were once forest people for hundreds of millions of years. We had forests that we were in contact with. We're losing the perspective of the synergism and the symbiosis of the ecosystem that's given us birth. I think it's wise for us to go full circle and to reinvestigate. Thank you very much.